Well, hello. Uh, formally welcome everybody today. We are very grateful to have you joining us for today's access through innovation conversation. I am Erin Mayhood, Chief Product Officer at Mentor Collective, and I've been in higher education for my entire career. I first started in libraries and information science, but then really branched out into usability, open access, and student success. I'm truly honored today to be here as part of this series to host conversations and break through the illusion of formality with prominent educators, officers, and entrepreneurs. We want to show the relatable side of leadership, its roots in the human experience and the daily lessons it brings. So today is going to be a very special conversation and I hope it leaves you feeling as motivated and inspired as I have been feeling working with Daryl Graham, SVP Engagement and HBCU Initiative at Strata Education Foundation. Now, for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with Mentor Collective, we help higher education institutions of all shapes and sizes deploy high impact, large scale mentorship programs uh, through programming that's driven by research, services, and technology. I hope that you can tell from the word collective in our name that at the heart of everything that we do here is with a group of leaders, experts, and institutions that are dedicated to student success. We ensure that mentorship provides an overlay to their strategy by providing peer insights and the ability to assess and foster student success factors at very key parts of the student experience. We want to make the power of peers and near peers a feature of every student's college experience. Oh, I have a beautiful connection to make today. And so before we deep dive into our conversation with Daryl, please let me quickly welcome Dr. Nina Lyon-Bennett, Assistant Dean for Academics at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, who's got some exciting news to share. Nina from an institution that together with nine other HBCUs has partnered with Mentor Collective to drive student success and workforce development. Oh, Nina, what a great opportunity. You partner both with Mentor Collective and Strata. I'd like to welcome you today and just give you a moment to share with our audience. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for that brief introduction and for the opportunity uh, to be here this afternoon. As you see on the screen, uh, this announcement was just made about a wonderful collaboration between the 1890 Center of Excellence for Student Success and Workforce Development and Mentor Collective. Uh, we had previously partnered with Mentor Collective to, to provide a, a mentoring program on each one of our campuses, but now we've expand, expanded that to see how we can leverage our resources to make sure that our students are ready for the workforce. And so we are partnering with Mentor Collective uh, to offer an opportunity to engage our alumni and our industry partners in a mentoring opportunity to prepare our students to leave college and to successfully enter their careers or professional, uh, professional schools. So I'm really excited about this opportunity. One, because it's all about building connections. Uh, two, it's all about growing collaborations. And it looks at how do we enhance the relationships that we have across uh, HBCUs to leverage the resources? How do we engage our students to create this sense of belonging that we've talked about and we know is hugely important to their success uh, academically, socially, emotionally, uh, psychologically, even financially? How do we create that sense of belonging and that sense of community uh, for our students so that they can graduate in a timely fashion and then become productive members of their communities? So I'm excited to be here this afternoon. Thank you again for the opportunity to share about what we are doing. And I'm happy to share 
share with anybody uh, who would like to know more about what we're doing, um, please feel free to reach out to me. And so now I'll turn it back over to you. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Nina. And now, of course, today is uh, not just about uh, all, not about Mentor Collective, but um, as Alex always likes to say, Alex, one of our um, fantastic marketers, uh, we wouldn't invite anybody into our home without giving a little glimpse of who we are. And so uh, thank you, Nina, for helping give it from your perspective. Uh, we love working with leaders like you. And of course, Daryl, who now I am going to very formally introduce you, Daryl. <laughs> I'm very excited to welcome Daryl Graham, SVP Engagement and HBCU Initiative at Strata Education Network. He'll share his vision for fostering connections with historically Black colleges and universities to drive student success. As an HBCU alum, Daryl has a strong track record in leading philanthropic initiatives in higher education and in the corporate sector. Daryl has been instrumental in developing initiatives at Strata that amplify HBCU's transformative influence, including forging connections between employers and future graduates. Daryl, it is an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to have this conversation with us. Good afternoon and good morning. I see folks from all over the world actually on this call, which is great. So thank you so much for that warm introduction, Aaron. And I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to represent uh, me, myself, uh, and our colleagues at Strata who are excited about the opportunities to help more students and adult learners gain access to positive post-secondary pathways that lead to opportunities and equitable opportunities is a big part of that. So we appreciate you, Mentor Collective, for inviting us to this conversation, and we look forward to uh, uh, having a great time doing it. So thank you. Well, thank you. And I think one of the uh, one of the things we love about the fireside chat is it allows us to openly share and get really authentic about things that we're passionate about. And Daryl, your reputation precedes you as a leader uh, whose values consistently shine through in really every undertaking, uh, your varied experiences, uh, accomplishments in your career stand testament to this. So I thought maybe we could get started with having you share just how your lived experience has allowed you to reimagine uh, the way philanthropy works in higher education. Well, thank you for that wonderful question. And so, uh, you know, it, it aligns really well with who I am as a person, uh, as a proud alum of an HBCU. Uh, with 30 plus years of experience, most of it being in, in philanthropy now, um, I, I really wanted to make a difference, you know, in this arena uh, by going beyond the surface uh, and gaining better understanding of needs. So the the, the listening skills, um, things that are important, the, the feeling of being empowered, a uh, big part of that, uh, breaking down the barriers, if you will, that are preventing people from having success. Uh, and knowing that those things happen for me um, it was it was just a part of who I am as a person when we began talking about this HBCU initiative uh, here at Strata, uh, that the whole idea of empowerment, leadership development all came to life for me. So uh, listening, a big part of this, um, something that is very different, you know, a different approach, if you will, to making uh, inroads and, and gaining a better understanding, because when you gain that sort of insight, from many stakeholders, not just a few, um, and you seek to build partnership, uh, you tend to develop solutions that answer questions and create opportunity for all. And that's really what this came about. So it tied in really well with me as a, as a person, my personal uh, goals and objectives and who I am as an individual authentically uh, and the, the alignment of what we do as an organization here at Strata. Mm. Thank you for sharing that and really shows how the lived experience can really translate into fantastic leadership and really does explain how uh, so much of your work is centered around collaborative efforts leading to uh, a lot of innovation. So if we take that principle and delve into your work that you're leaving, leading at Strata, 
the Strata HBCU initiative has been making headlines recently, fantastic headlines uh, for work in promoting degree attainment and economic mobility among HBCUs. Congratulations on this. And a big part of that work was the HBCU listening tour. Could you talk to us about this initiative's core principles and mission and how these might inform best practices for other institutions seeking to promote degree attainment and economic mobility. Sure, and, and thank you for those kind remarks, Aaron. It, we've we've been posting a lot and we've been visiting a lot of campuses. In fact, we just got back from a, a couple of visits to South Carolina and uh, New Orleans uh, last week. Uh, but you know, our, Strata's HBCU initiative, it's, it's really focused on uh, leadership development with emphasis on work-based learning, quality coaching, and helping to make the experience an affordable one through scholarship. Uh, we started in the fall of 2021 as a part of the initiative kicking off as a pilot with 28 partner institutions, uh, 81 Strata Scholars, and have since added an additional 22 institutions and now have over 300 scholars as part of the initiative. The, the ultimate goal here is to develop the next generation of leaders through scholarship, educational, and work-based learning experiences in partnership with HBCUs. And so uh, as we begin on this journey and thinking about you know, additional components to your question around why, um, there was a lot going on you know, in 2020 when we started having the conversation. And the, the approach was, let's gain a better understanding of what was happening on HBCU campuses after the board approved uh, this initiative to, to move forward. And so uh, what better way than to start in the middle of COVID? Nobody's really in, in, in meetings, in rooms, in buildings anymore. And so uh, we reached out to all HBCUs and uh, we did a listening tour. And on that listening tour, we gained a significant amount of insights on what the needs are and how the needs had changed, uh, not just with COVID, but with the, the other you know, existing conditions that were taking place ar around the communities uh, where HBCUs are. So uh, one of those things for us was not just to handpick institutions, but to reach out to all and have those who are interested um, reach back. And we had several conversations, um, more than 30 conversations with HBCU leaders, and, there, and many of them brought their teams to discuss what those needs were. And so uh, happy to share a little bit more if you'd like to go <laughs> talk a little bit uh -huh. about this tour, uh, which we, we can get into. Absolutely. Uh, listening to learn, it sounds like it's such a crucial part of your strategy here to really identify what was needed. So as such a crucial part of the initiative was designed to listen and learn from administrators, sounds like your team came out really better understanding capacity needs and uh, ways to effectively support HBCUs. Emerging themes <laughs> from the listening tour have clearly influenced the approach that this initiative has taken. Can you share more about those themes and how they've been incorporated into the initiative's work? Sure. Um, we heard several. Um, we, we sort of compartmentalized them in, in the four categories. And the first one was really talking about, you know, what types of things were happening on campus with students and how were students, you know, successfully moving forward. And we, we found out that one of the key points of that conversation, or if you will, dialogue, was by removing that financial barrier, you know, from students, it allowed them to focus on their educational experiences more, and it improved the retention rates, it improved graduation rates, and some, most of those graduation rates that we heard about were, were in that 95 to 98 percent range, which was fairly significant to hear. So uh, that helped to inform us of, you know, what type of scholarship would we be thinking about as it relates to the initiative and how could we then think about the best you know, way to recommend that as we went back to our board of trustees. And then secondly, um, you know, we heard about the, the creation of more impactful partnerships as it relates to employers. And I know uh, uh, Nina probably can speak to this probably better than I could, but uh, there were many different things that were underway um, as a part of that. Many folks had already decided that they were going to um, uh, eliminate previous strategies around, you know, employer or industry councils 
where people would meet quarterly um, and begin to think about how you have more depth with those employer partnerships. And so right. getting, you know, to, you know, five to 10 versus trying to have ankle deep relationships with 30, uh, let's go neck deep uh, with partnerships right. and see see how we can move forward collectively. And we can talk about that a little bit more as well. And then, of course, we heard a lot about leadership development taking place uh, on on various campuses. And I'm looking at the screen, I see a lot of uh, our existing partners of the 50 on the call. So great to see you all as well. Uh, but we heard about the, the various things that were happening there um, where most institutions had identified leadership development as an, a significant or important, you know, to their campus uh, and to their students going forward. They were at various stages of, of where they wanted to be or where they were going as it relates to it. Some had previously started, you know, leadership development initiatives, or some were looking to advance them in a way where there was more of a campus-wide approach where a specific set of leaders could begin to develop additional components of leadership development uh, to help more students have access. Uh, so that those are real key things. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, we, we heard the, the, the changing, if you will, a relationship with alumni in a lot of cases where Many folks were just looking for resources from alumni versus um, now many institutions were talking about strategic ways in which they're working with alumni to play a specific role in um, helping with talent, mentoring and coaching, um, helping with building relationships with their with their own employers in, in some cases and helping them to build additional relationships to help the mission of the, the institution to move forward. So that change in alumni was was great. So. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. We see uh, we see great success, especially with early alumni uh, jumping into action, giving back to their institution by working with current students. I am going to take you up on your invitation to talk more about university and employer relationships. But first, I just want to ask a, a just a, a direct follow up about um how these learnings that you just shared could be applied to enhance the support other stakeholders in higher education can provide to HBCUs. So if you were to consolidate like everything that you've learned, how can others uh, be helping? Yeah, that's a great question, Aaron. I, I would think of it this way, um, based on what we learned, um, you know, as a, again, I graduated from an HBCU a very long time ago, to tell about the gray hair. But um, so, you know, there, I think there are a lot of things that come with just gaining a better understanding and how that could work and yes. thinking about, you know, true partnership, um, you know, a, a lot of relationships. And I see Nina's note about transactional versus, you know, building a relationship. Um, we, we move away from this by, you know, gaining a better understanding of what those needs are uh, on, on our HBCU campuses and in their surrounding communities. And then developing, you know, some solutions to that based on what you heard uh, and what you believe the needs are. It helps to create a much better way to partner and it creates, you know, more of a strategic philanthropy approach to how you can address those issues. I mean, we've been to several states, you know, there are 19 states that we're covering with 50 institutions uh, and there are institutions that are in the same state that are HBCUs, but the, the culture and environment is very different. And so this approach that, you know, one HBCU approach can work, uh, that's really not the case. It is figuring out how you can partner more broadly. Mm -hmm. and um, There still has to be some empowerment, you know, with the campuses being able to do what they do already, Right. Many institutions, some have been around for over 150 years. I, I, I would like to think that they pretty much know what they're doing. Right. right. So how, how can we come alongside and add value to what they're already doing and give more opportunity? So, you know, we talk about D&I a great deal here at Strata. Uh, and one of the things that's really helpful is that that, that inclusiveness has always been on a, to, to us or to me as well. Uh, lived experience at an HBCU campus. But the opportunity to broaden the reach for initiatives like these, you know, where more students can have opportunity is something that we should be thinking about from a philanthropic perspective going yeah. forward. And so the hope is that, you know, this is an example, just one example of how uh, it can be thought of and how it can be built and developed 
Uh, and this is not what Strata did. This is what the leaders of HBCUs, and we spoke to 35 institutions as a part of the listening tour, that really shaped, you know, how the initiative was framed and how we moved forward. So that helped to create those less transactional, I'll say, <laughs> relationships yeah. and more depth. And and so we can talk a little about this later, but you know, part of it is telling the story for us. You know, we're spending time on campus and we're doing other things. We have a leadership summit, which you see that behind me is the stage, you know, for, for last year's leadership summit. And so the thought of being able to take the deeper dive with, you know, has to come as a part of the pathway forward, but that does not happen without true partnership. Absolutely. And you're opening the door um, to some some really direct <laughs> real talk conversation about how HBCUs have been transforming really the future of higher education. And it's not just a recent uh, thing. This has been ongoing and there has been historical underfunding all along. Um, and so that just really wants us to lean into more. Um, could you help shed some additional light on strategies HBCUs can employ to succeed in student success? You're talking about the partnerships, uh, togetherness here. What other lessons can be learned from their resilience and how to move forward? Yeah. Um, again, I, I, it starts with, you know, the leader and we, we you know, yeah. the, uh, <laughs> I, hate to, I hate to add any, uh, you know, any thoughts around that because people know we're talking about leadership development, but I, I just think that, you know, and we, we, we think that, you know, there's a great amount of things that are already happening on campus. Like there's there's mentoring and coaching is taking place on HBCU mm -hmm. campuses. Um, there's a great amount of it that's happening. It isn't just with faculty. We're we're seeing it, you know, at the you know administrative level and even some cases at the at the board of trustees level. And so this this whole idea of sort of framing that, and again, I mentioned at the alumni level in, in, in cases as well. But thinking about that more importantly, and, and we'll talk about this in some call to actions later, but that, that's a pretty interesting call to action, but it's a very powerful tool, you know, and we hear this all the time, you know, at our summit, you know, we, we asked our CEO and, and some of our leaders and our trustees to come to that event, which we host in Atlanta the past two years. Um, some scholars basically told us that I, this is the first time I ever met a CEO. So the, 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 the power that you have as a leader, you know, change the, the trajectory of a student and their level of engagement in the, in the educational process. And we believe that these interactions are very helpful. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of support we see from faculty, staff, administrators, and alumni that are helping to prove that and improve what Nina talked about earlier, that sense of belonging, that feeling of trust, uh, being included and feeling like you're a part of something. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we were seeking to do as a part of this. It is, we, we were very fortunate that the HBCU community allowed us in and allowed us to be accepted into that space and now allow us to be a partner. And that's really up to them to decide, not for us. We're just very fortunate and honored that that actually took place. So that's really important too, that feeling of, of, of inclusiveness. Um, creating experiences, you know, on and off campuses that allow students to develop skills and abilities that will impact them for the rest of their life. Uh, we, we talk about, you know, Sometimes people call them soft skills and those sorts of things. Um, um, these are these are real skills that you need in order to 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 be to, to live personally and professionally and to be successful. And so they're they're really life skills, you know, and more more than anything else. So life skills is a big part of, you know, an, an intervention of development. We work with students, and we hear a lot about that happening on, on the various campuses across the country. And then last, I'll say, you know, just the whole idea of you know, the innovation that's gone into and the creativity in developing programs and initiatives that address students' issues, not just the, you know, the students that are, you know, really smart and are going to do well anyway, but to think about how you can develop those leaders on campus and those leaders on campus can be helpful at providing, you know, more tools and resources to help more students campus-wide or comprehensively. Um, that's something that uh, we're seeing a great deal of as well, and it seems to be working very well. 
Well, a theme that I'm really hearing, I, the sense of belonging points, um, seeing what you can be. I'm just looking at the comments as well. We talk a lot here about the transitions, these key transition students are going through. And um, when you're starting school, seeing and being with somebody with that shared experience so you can feel that you belong. And then there's another major transition when you're getting ready to leave school and you you need to feel like you're getting ready to belong in that new thing uh, that you're about to see. So let's transition to that a little bit and talk about this university employer partnership. We see internally more and more students uh, at Mentor Collective, when we ask them at the beginning of their mentorship what their goal is, and they're talking about things like internships, um, experience-based learning, picking up these skills. So you have tremendous experience um, in forging university employee partnerships. Uh, this is so key and critical for institutions right now. Can you share some best practices, innovative strategies? Um, that have been effective in forging those connections between higher education and the workforce to help students achieve these goals? Sure, sure. Great and a great question, Aaron. Um, you know, we, we've seen robust partnerships with educators and employers being developed. Um, some were already in place uh, when we you know, started on this journey. And in my previous role before joining Strata, we, we did some of that work as well. Uh, but, you know, the, the key to this is there, there, in most of those cases where there's great success or uh, outstanding or impactful, whatever you want to call it, success, is the, the two-way feedback, you know, that has to exist there where you're helping to improve a process or to inform curriculum. Uh, those are the things that we've seen that have worked really well. And in the early parts of this initiative, um, that's been a big part of uh, what's been working and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the paid internship uh, work that we've been doing in partnership with HBCUs. Uh, but what students are learning in the classroom can only be applied if there is that two-way feedback between those partnerships that exist with employers and that feedback loop. And so we believe that the that relationship of building uh, partnership is going to help more students find success. So, so I think two key things I'll make a point about in, in, in that conversation is, you know, Paid internships tied to field of study you know, are really motivating students to stay engaged in both work and their, their studies and often lead to full time opportunities. Um, you know, when you've spent time, you know, inside of a, an, an organization and understanding what they do and where they are, and, and there's a culture that exists there that you feel comfortable with and you feel good about. Uh, you're going to go back and you're going to spend time there. And we're seeing a lot of that taking place. We haven't had but a few graduates yet, but uh, many of them uh, are talking about their experience of development and their experience, yeah. that paid internship opportunity, that internship access, you know, in the workforce, in an industry, but in the field tied to their field of study uh, gives them a great deal of, uh, more confidence. Confidence. And confidence can be everything, as as we know, to help you take that next step forward. Now, I know there are people on this call right now who are saying, "Okay, but how do I form? How do I form these types of partnerships? How how can I make this happen at my institution?" Yeah, I, I think it's all about you know you as an institution really defining what it is that you're looking for, what you're mm -hmm. seeking. Uh, and if, when you clearly define what you're seeking, I think that's when you can reach out to employers to find out, you know, if they are aligned, you know, with your core values as an organization, as an institution, and find out a little bit more about them. Uh, they're, uh, all employers are seeking to find talent, uh, and they're trying to figure out if they can be a part of that development of talent. And that's what we're seeing that's stronger in those relationships, uh, in the, the partnerships that we've seen be very successful early on is that those relationships uh, are, have, have depth and there's a two-way loop that occurs there where there's feedback, uh, there's curriculum enhancements, uh, there's deeper partnership. Um, we spend time on campuses. We're seeing employers spend time on campuses as well, uh, meeting with faculty, meeting with provosts and deans and the like. And so that's where you get into depth of partnership when uh, you have someone who, or an organization who's really interested and, and jumping in, you know, to the water with you neck deep, and coming up with solutions uh, to to issues around bridging that gap between education and employment, uh, and, and actually doing it. And so we see a lot of that 
taking place, the execution of it, as well as the alignment of, of core values and mission. And so when you have that take place, it becomes a lot easier uh, to make that transition for students and scholars uh, who go into those environments and feel more comfortable, feel more confident, and are, and are far more successful. Right. And now you're starting to talk about impacts. And I know you and I uh, and our organizations really, really align on um, how do we measure impact? How we show? How do we show the impact? So initiatives like this um, are really needed to support the work of HBCUs. And since its launch in October 2021, uh, the Strata HBCU initiative has expanded from 28 institutions to now include uh, nearly half of all HBCUs. So again, congratulations on the momentum that you're building here. Now, can you, let's talk about impact. Can you elaborate on the tangible impacts that you've seen so far? Um, economic mobility of the 50 partner HPCUs, how does it foster financial growth, drive student success? Uh, what other lessons can we learn? So what have you learned so far that you can share with us? Yeah, you know, we, we learned, we've been learning from the time we started having conversations mm -hmm. with the listeners for sure and, and you know we continue to listen when we spend time on campus and and uh hear about what's happening we, we meet with campus leaders and meet with our scholars and others to to, to talk about these various topics I, i'll say we'll have a much better idea on how the initiative will will have economic impact you know once we begin to see more of a uh a full class or a complete class or two uh finish and wrap up and, and move into the workforce or head into graduate school but in the meantime we do have some early evidence of, of success. Um, our first cohort of scholars, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is about 81 of them. Uh, they, we had a 95% re retention rate, 95% retention rate in year one. And uh, our second cohort had an 87% retention rate. So that probably uh, amounts to about 186 of the scholars that we have now uh, with that with that statistic. Yeah. Uh, and in year one, our first cohort had 89% participate in internships tied to field of study, where 90% of those internships were paid. Uh, still gathering information on cohort two because they had their first inter inter internship experience this past summer. So we'll have more to, to say on that uh, at a later time. But another key is all, all Strata scholars, because since it's a leadership development initiative, have experienced multiple leadership development activities in each of their first two years. Um, and so that also aligns with, you know, what's happening on the campus or what's happening in the community. And the types of experiences that we believe will, will impact uh, our communities where HBCUs are, is when you see institutions and their, and their students and their faculty and leaders talking about, you know, improving the relationship with law enforcement as an example. So we look at that as impact as well. We were in South Carolina and one of our partners um, had this campaign called uh, I'm Afraid for My Life. And mm -hmm. instead of just sitting there talking about it and complaining about it, they, they got faculty and staff together. They got law enforcement from around the surrounding counties. Uh, and they brought um, uh, civic leaders and elected officials all together in, in one room to talk about how they could improve relations and make a better life for everyone who lives in the community, not just the, the, the HBCUs. So the HBCUs impact on what hap what's happening in their respective communities is another way in which we're going to measure some measure impact going forward. You know, Daryl, I'm really struck by the way you're balancing kind of leading indicators in the human, you know, sharing of what is meaningful with the numbers, right? I, I just, in, even um, in hearing you speak, yes, you are measuring retention and you are measuring engagement and participation, but you're also taking in um, the stories, uh, the qualitative information of, of the impact that this is happening, which uh, just really strikes me. I, I don't always hear every leader speaking about that, just about the stories along the way and the way you can kind of evolve how the initiative unfolds and how you work just based on those learnings as well. So just thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, I think so many of us are very inspired by the human stories in here. And 
Um, I was wondering if you could share some more success story from the initiative, uh, just demonstrating the impact that it's having. It could be an inspirational example from uh, institutions, um, people that you've worked with, students you've impacted. Do you have more to share with us? Sure, uh, I, I do one that was- really I choose. Yes, in New Orleans. <laughs> We had a great time, and I think I saw uh, Miss Taplin on on the call. And uh, we we have two students there who are graduating early, so this is a four year initiative mm -hmm. for each student. Uh, we have two students there who are graduating in two and a half years. They finished all their requirements, um, and and got there in two different ways. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the affordability component comes into play. Talk about you know leadership development and talk about coaching. Um, at, at how at how these two people arrived at the same place, taking a different journey. And this is why it's very important, you know, to understand, you know, this whole idea of mentoring and coaching and meeting people where they are. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, one student dual enrollment, you know, did really well in high school and had a plan for how you know she was going to get there, and really focused on I'm going to get there in two and a half years, and here's what my approach is going to be. So. By taking that financial component away, uh, that made it very affordable you know, for her to move on. It, it made it an opportunity for her to develop as a leader and feel confident who she are being on an HBCU campus and feeling that sense of inclusion and belonging. And, and then thinking about all the mentoring and coaching <clears throat> that has occurred uh, with not just on campus, but through those work-based learning experiences, uh, ready to go to that next uh, stop for her as a part of her educational journey, as a part of her pathway, you know, forward. And so when we think about how this initiative came about and listening and learning, if we would have developed it in a way in which you couldn't address those different issues, it would have been hard for, for her to do that. And then we have another student, same place, right? Another student, same place, very did a very different thing. And it's just amazing that we have seen her flourish. She's a full-time mom full-time student, took full-time credits, you know, in some cases took 21 credits. Uh, but again, graduated, finished requirements in two and a half years, just a different journey to get there. Just yeah. the whole notion of creating the opportunity for it to be affordable for scholars. They can make well-informed decisions with the leaders on their campus to really figure out how it works best for them in order to get there. So two totally different examples arriving at the same place at the same time helps us to confirm that, you know, we did listen well, we did, you know, strategically develop the initiative in a way in which many different people, you know, can find their way and find success uh, by removing those additional barriers and having access to people who can right. help in an opportunity to move on. And so it was, it was, it was very enlightening, you know, conversation to have with them both together and individually, but it's just an example of how, you know, leadership, that sense of belonging, campus life, strong, you know, strong commitment to what you want to do, feeling that you belong and people care about you gives you the, the things that you need in order for you to be successful. And that's what we heard in all of that. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you chose two uh, very, very different examples. It's just so key, so key. Um, I was just wondering if we could just for a second dive back into what you heard uh, from presidents and students during the HBCU listening tour. Um, more opportunities for transformative change do you see? Which, which opportunities do you see in HBCUs that leaders at other institutions should seize at this moment? So you've, you've heard so much, you've learned so much. What should we all be listening for? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, HBCUs are, you know, this a, it's a special institution. It has, you know, <laughs> it's a very, you know, different brain. But, you know, I, I think that, that that sense of belonging and the sense of inclusion that exists yeah. and then have, have to be an HBCU for that to happen. I think if you're at an, a, an institution where that environment does exist, uh, I think it allows for people to, to find their way, um, get the support they need, quality coaching, um, helping to make affordable and gaining access to, to tools and resources that are going to help you to matriculate successfully and complete and move on to the next uh, goal or objective that you plan to do. Um, yeah. 
And so I think that's a big part of, you know, how I think success can go for, for many, you know, who choose to go down the pathway of post-secondary education. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to talk a little bit more about, you know, then, you know, calling things to action and talking about that, we can, we can get into that, but yes. you know, none of us got here, you know, I'm, I'm to people raise their hand, but you can put something in the chat. If, if you made it this far, I see a lot of PhDs and a lot of MBAs and folks who I know who have postgraduate degrees. Um, none of us got here on our own. If there's anybody on this call who got there on their own, please put a note up, raise your hand. Because I don't know anybody that's done that. So the, the value of relationships, the value of mentorship, the value of coaching, uh, that, that is a big part of what success you know, looks like for, for, for all of us. And by having that take place at more, you know, post-secondary institutions and programs and initiatives focused on that, uh, believe that we'll have far greater success for students, no matter what their situation is. But being able to address their situation with real solutions is really important. And, you know, we talk about um, partnership for just a second, right? It's about changing the approach, right, to partnerships. You know, focus right. on listening first, right? Uh, right? And outline desired outcomes, you know, with those who are going to be impacted by it. We, we didn't have access to students as we started on the initiative. Uh, so we spent a lot of time with, 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 with campus leaders and their leadership teams to better understand. Now that we have scholars, they're informing us you know, through surveys or through feedback loops, you know, through points of contact. And we have some of our points of contact who are on this call. Uh, that has helped us really well. Uh, one of the things that helps us with partnership and call to action, right, is <laughs> we have a person on our team that is the point of contact. So you don't have to figure out who to go look for to ask a question to get a, to, to get some information but to have a better understanding. Just as we do with the with each institution, each institution has a point of contact that we can reach to and, and have discussion with and plan activities and better understand how we can be more helpful. That communication chain that exists is what helps us to move forward very successfully. And so um, the, the last thing I'd say about this is when you start to think about how philanthropy can function a, a little bit more differently, um, and starting the way that we did with a listening tour uh, and understanding, gaining a much better understanding, it, it's, it's, it's the time, you know, and it's a great time to really think about this, but a reimagined, you know, philanthropic construct, you know, where people are stakeholders are really driving, you know, how we move forward and sharing information, um, creating communities of, of practice and success um, could be very helpful in how we reimagine you know, philanthropy and strategic philanthropy as we move forward. And I think that's something that we can learn from this, this initiative as well. Such a different approach that you have taken. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really struck by the power of listening and how it can change uh, the course of an initiative like this. And the laser focus that you've had on the key components that that you heard affordability, opportunity for leadership and career development and quality coaching. Um, it comes out loud and clear that through listening, you're finding the different pathways to achieve, but these key components are guiding everything. And Daryl, it's just, it's so lovely to hear your approach of listening, but also focus on what needs to be accomplished and what will be most meaningful. Thank you so much, Aaron. All right. Uh, uh, Aaron, do you want to, there are folks on the line that have a question? We have a little yes. bit of time. Yeah. Wonderful. So uh, we have one question in about how, from Phyllis, uh, how to address building partnerships with arts organizations and HBCUs. So thinking about opera companies, theaters, orchestras, musicians, any thoughts to share on that, Daryl? That's interesting. Uh, we do have some students who are musically inclined. We, we actually started this past year a showcase. Um, uh, and we have a student who plays the piano and sings and, and that great stuff. Uh, we we had no idea that, you know, this young man, we knew he played the piano. We had no idea he was that talented. I, I think forging partnerships, uh, back to Nina's points early, point earlier, uh, was really helpful. So if there's a HBCU near you or you know, close by and or, you know, that they have a music program or an arts program 
um, this particular young man is in South Carolina and he, you know, was driving back and forth between his institution in Orangeburg and down to, to Charleston to be a part of a, a, a performance uh, a organization there. And so um, he actually sought out this uh, organization and, and they created a great partnership and he, he developed some you know, some very interesting skills to sing through this partnership. And so I, I think there's an opportunity, you know, there. Um, there are many institutions uh, down south and in the southeast. Uh, if you're in those locations, uh, try to figure out how you can build those partnerships well. Uh, just reach out. You know, we have several folks and we're happy to help make some connections as well. Um, my, I do want to add my, my colleague, Damian Padilla, is on the call. If you want to reach out to one of us, we're happy to, to help there. Well, I love I love that you said just reach out. Sometimes we all have the perception that there's a barrier, um, but so many people are receptive uh, to to the outreach and uh, are just looking for an opportunity like that. So thank you for the question. Now, I, Daryl, I just I again, I have to thank you for spending this time with us and speaking so authentically about what you've learned um, and your approach. And we can't wait to follow you over the next next few years to see how this grows. Um, and we're all here wanting to learn with you and to share more. And so thank you. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, Aaron, and to Mentor Collective. Um, it's just, I think it's rather uh, interesting that you all are called the uh, Mentor Collective because it goes back to the point you know that I made earlier about none of us got to run our own. And mm -hmm. so collectively mentoring, you know, we can make big, you know, big and significant change. And we believe that the work that you all are doing is making big and significant change. And we are, we believe that the work that we're doing in partnership with HBCUs is going to do that as we create the next generation of leaders. So I do want to say on behalf of my wonderful and esteemed colleagues uh, at Strata Education Foundation, that we are very excited that you allowed us this opportunity. And we, uh, Looking forward to sharing more about our progress and work uh, in partnership with our tremendous HBCU partners, some of who are you on this call. So, mm. well, the pleasure is all of ours. Um, we we have learned so much from this, and it does take all of us to make the have the impact that we want to have. So, thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, uh, for those of you on the call, if you if you would like to join our next fireside chat, it will be held Monday, December eighteenth, from one to two, uh, with Dr. Monica Paris Trent, uh, Chief Program Officer from Achieving the Dream. So, um, if you like this format of the intimate, uh, thoughtful conversation, I encourage you to enjoy uh, and to join our future fireside chats. And then, of course, uh, you will be able to listen to this again. Uh, so we strongly promote sharing, um, sharing more about what you've learned from Daryl today and what Daryl, you so thoughtfully uh, gave to us. And so please don't hesitate um, you, to share this forward and send us questions afterwards if they come up. Sometimes those things pop up after the event itself. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And a huge thank you to you. Daryl. Wishing you all well.